John Anderson, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. Firstly, on the Christchurch massacre, you were Deputy Nationals Leader when John Howard responded to the Port Arthur massacre with some gun control measures. What are the challenges facing Jacinda Ardern? Well, in the awful situation they find themselves in, I'd just make a couple of remarks. One is consult very widely based on our experiences. Recognise the technical difficulties will be quite surprising. Which firearms, how can they be modified, and so on and so forth. Recognise too that there will be many good citizens who are sporting shooters or whatever who will be very sensitive to the charge that somehow they're being painted as less than good citizens. So take them with you and firmness and resolution will see the day through, I believe. All right. Now, the, the party that you once led appears to be deeply split with itself and with its partner, the Liberal Party, seems no, unable to resolve itself on climate and energy policy. Is this split permanent, do you think? No, nothing's ever permanent. But what actually worries me is that disunity in politics, well, let's call a spade a spade, the sort of fracturing we've seen over the last 10 years that people are so worried about, unfortunately in many ways reflects the fracturing of the Australian community. And in many ways the revolving door prime ministership problem of the last decade is closely related to energy policy when you stop and look back over the triggers at various points. Let's deal with energy policy in a few minutes time but let's just stick with the nationals for a tick. Do you believe the, that the, uh, the nationals are acting in aid or against coalition unity? They've certainly, if you like, uh, as uh, we did occasionally, although you know, it's always best done behind closed doors, uh, tested the boundaries. But what I do see at the heart of this is a difference over how best to proceed. Some of the people calling for the most radical action on climate change are a little inclined to say, let's deal with climate change with someone else's job. Let me bring you back to the Nationals. Now, Barnaby Joyce seems to be agitating for a return to the job. Is that how you see it? I think he got a clear message that uh, the future is the future, but for now, the party has a leader and they need a group around that leader as they've always done in the past. So what's your message to Barnaby Joyce? Unity is incredibly important. How do the Nationals reconcile the pressures and politics of North Queensland which is influenced by the appeal of One Nation, for example, with the politics further south? I think it's an incredibly good question and it concerns me very deeply. I don't take it lightly. I am worried that we are seeing uh, the emergence here of some very deep schisms that are actually affecting all political parties. If you look at it objectively, all political parties now are trying to balance people who have vastly different views on a range of subjects, not least of all energy policy and emissions. Hey George. Particularly if those who, if you like, feel secure in their jobs, they're not concerned about paying a price themselves for carbon abatement because it is expensive, are going to paint those who are worried about their jobs as somehow deplorables. If we're not really careful, I say this very sincerely, I believe that we will manage a terrible trifecta out of the whole emissions and energy debate. The first is we will damage our economy because carbon abatement is expensive and part of the problem we've got now with the fragmentation of the Australian community is they've not been told the truth. The second is, if we're not very careful, we will fracture our community and here's the third, the great irony. If we don't focus on the only game in town with emissions, which is bringing down global emissions, we might find we damage our own economy, divide our own society, send industries offshore. A classic example of that uh, would be aluminium smeltering to places where, in fact, the global outcome is made worse because of lower standards and dirtier fuel. There seems to be a deep schism, though, to use your word, uh, in the coalition between those who are barracking for the interests of North Queensland and those further south. What, this, this looks irreconcilable, doesn't it? Well, I think there's a, it reflects a deep schism. It's there in all of the political parties, if we're honest at the moment. You don't get good public policy out of a bad public debate. The first thing we've got to do here is to put on the table, on carefully analysed uh, research uh, into uh, 
uh, these uh, various scenarios before us, what the impact on the economy and therefore on people will be. I think you're speaking there in support of Brian Fisher's uh, modelling. Is that so? Because I, I know that you've written in, in favour of it. Brian Fisher is the modeller who did the work for the Hawke government, the Keating government and the government that I was part of. He was in fact part of my portfolio for many years. He's a standout modeller. His recent economic modelling seems apocalyptic. He's, he's talking about the coalition's policy. He says that's going to cost $70 billion in GDP and 78,000 fewer jobs. He says of Labor's $472 billion damage to the economy and 336,000 fewer jobs. Surely that, that can't be right. Well, we've got to show where it's wrong. This is one of the world's most respected modellers. And that work has now been peer-reviewed out of Stanford University. So it has to be taken seriously. The critics say that he doesn't, hasn't taken into consideration the, the cost of renewables, which has always been uh, underestimated, the rate by which they become cheaper. I think that in no way relieves political parties and the media of the responsibility of unpacking his work and showing clearly where it's wrong. The last time we had a debate about a major economic change in Australia was the GST. Every detail was poured over. Every detail was tested. This is a bigger change. It requires a great deal of attention. And I have to be frank, we really need to know from the Labor Party whether they will allow for the Kyoto carry forwards where we overachieved on our Kyoto targets or not. We also need to know which sectors they will exempt because they so-called trade exposed. But according to Brian Fisher, both sides of politics are going to cause and willingly cause damage to the economy. Well, point one is the Australian people have to be told the truth. Carbon abatement is expensive. So they're not being told the truth? Plainly not. The research shows that they are uncertain and confused about the best way forward and what the parties intend doing. You can't blame them after the last 10 years. Trust has broken down in the system in Australia. There is no two ways about that. The ANU's work on this is extraordinary. We're in uncharted waters. Because we are in danger in this mess of overlooking the fact that we're just 1.15% of global emissions and if we're not careful, we will push up global emissions even if we get ours down. That would be an own goal of the first order. Households have dealt with a 120% increase in power prices the past decade. Both sides of politics have failed them. So you know, why should they trust any pledge from either side? This is my very point. Going forward, what we have before us are scenarios that are going to involve more dislocation and not just in power prices. And unless we can have a sensible debate, because we're agreed we need to do our bit as a nation on climate change, about how to do it, how to be fair, how to make certain that we don't just exacerbate the problem by pushing industries offshore where their outputs in terms of carbon are worse. One of the things that's pushed Australian figures up a little bit, although per capita we're at very low levels, we're performing very well, has been the LNG export industry out of Queensland. That may have a slightly negative impact on our input, but it may, in a global sense, be massively helping by pushing and displacing dirtier fuels that would otherwise be burned. So finally, a message to both sides of politics when it comes to energy and climate policy? To all of us, all of us, the politicians, the media, the people at large, we have to relearn how to have a fulsome, maybe a vigorous, even a loud and heated debate but it has to be based on the facts, it has to be based on truth, and it must respect the other view or the people putting the other view or we'll go nowhere. You don't get good public policy out of a bad or a sinist or a truncated or a dishonest debate. John Anson, thank you very much. Thank you.